recording this session. Uh, Kuhn, are you okay to join us now? Yes, I am here, Faith. Here I am. Thank you for joining us. I will stop sharing now and you can start sharing your screen. All right. Good morning, everybody. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Thanks, Faith, for organizing this uh, session and for inviting me. And I'll be very happy to uh, give you indeed some more insights in how to become a civil servant, you know, a permanent official uh, in the institutions. As uh, Faith said, and as you could see on the previous slide, I work in EPSO, the European Personnel Selection Office. And that is the office which exactly does what it says. It selects the staff for all EU institutions. So I'll give you some more information now on which institutions we select staff for, which profiles we need, uh, what we offer as an employer also, and then of course, how to become uh, one of us here uh, in Brussels or Luxembourg. Uh, I'll be speaking for about say half an hour, and then we have plenty of time to, to uh, answer questions. If you may have any, uh, I'll be here with you as long as you, as you need. Uh, I guess Faith, you will also share my slideshow with the participants, please distribute it uh, uh, freely. It'll be helpful for you um, if ever you want to take part in a competition uh, to become a civil servant. I will share my screen right now. And uh, here we go. So I'll move this box a bit to the right so you see the whole slide. Here you go. So as I said, I'll be explaining to you uh, quite um, in-depth information, if you like, on career opportunities with the EU institutions. And I said it up front, we select staff for about 10 different EU institutions and bodies. And I guess uh, when looking at this slide, you must recognize some of the logos of these institutions. So um, let's go through them, uh, then you see which ones they are. The top row, uh, top left, would be the European Parliament. I guess you're familiar with that one. The second one is the European or the Council of the European Union. The third one is the European Commission. Very well known, I guess. Then we've got the Court of Justice and the Court of Auditors on the second row. Next to the Court of Auditors is the logo of the European External Action Service. That is the body that runs or manages the delegations, which are, if you want, the EU embassies in third countries, so outside of the EU. Then we have two committees, the Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Regions. And then bottom left is the logo of the European Ombudsman. And bottom right is the smallest institution of them all, which is the European Data Protection Supervisor. So there you have them all. These are the 10 institutions and bodies that we select staff for. Altogether, these institutions employ about 40,000 staff, of which about 30,000 work for the Commission alone. So the Commission is by far the largest institution. Second would be the, the Parliament with about three to 4,000 staff. And then the other institutions are considerably smaller in, in size. Headquarters are based in Brussels and Luxembourg for all of these institutions, apart from one, the, the Ombudsman, just for, for you to know, the Ombudsman is based in Strasbourg. Now, apart from the offices, the headquarters in Brussels and Luxembourg, we also have opportunities to work outside of these two cities. We have, I already mentioned these delegations outside of the EU. We have what we call representations uh, in each EU member state. Then we have uh, joint research centers in a number of member states. And we have a whole network of EU agencies in practically all um, EU member states as well. So you can end up working in all these different places, but of course, uh, about 80% of staff works either in Brussels or Luxembourg. So mo most probably, if you start an EU career, you would start in Brussels or Luxembourg, all right? Now, who do we need here? We need, of course, many lawyers and many economists and many linguists because you know we produce legislation and uh, you know that we are an economic union after all and we communicate in 24 official eu languages so these three groups that i just mentioned are quite large groups of staff now we need apart from these big three in a way we need profiles or we need people from any given background as you can see on this slide uh, we need uh, specialists in finance in accounting in web design 
Uh, we need journalists, uh, psychologists, medical doctors, nuclear inspectors. I mean, think of anything and any given background can lead to a career with us. You saw, you've seen on the, the, the slide that Fate showed, you've seen my profile. I had a background in graphic engineering and then also economics. Uh, so I first worked in a, in a publishing publisher's company in Belgium before joining the EU. So it's maybe an atypical profile that I have, but you see, I also ended up here. So with any background you can have, you can um, find a, a, um, a career with us. This is basically the message I want to give uh, with this slide here. To be able to be eligible for a competition, I will speak about you know the competitions in a minute uh, to become an EU official, you need to meet only three criteria. You have to be a citizen of one of the EU member states. I guess everybody in this group um, can tick that box. You need to speak at least two EU languages. And I guess, again, you all speak Maltese and English, right? Uh, any other combination would also work, of course, um, uh, speaking about two EU languages. Mostly one of, the, one of the two will have to be either English or French, for instance, but for you guys, uh, since you all speak English uh, fluently, uh, there's no uh, language issue. The third criteria is the degree. You need either a graduate or a non-graduate degree. If you have a graduate degree, you can take part in competitions to become what we call administrators. Administrators are just, it's a bit of a dull term if you like, but it's the group of staff with a university level degree. And these people do mainly policy related work. For non-graduates, those are people without a university degree, we also have career opportunities. And these people are what we call assistants and they do more executive work. So do, those are the two career paths uh, that we offer here. So if you meet these three criteria, citizenship, languages, and a degree, you can take part in a competition to come and join us as a permanent civil servant. I'll speak about them in a minute, okay? So the, the, the conditions are quite easy in a way um, to, to at least to enter a competition. Of course, you would want to work in a multicultural, multilingual environment quite clearly. This is what we offer here. And I guess since you're all here in this session, you are interested in, in working in such an environment. As an employer, we offer quite something to our staff. First of all, there is a line of work. We, as you may know, we, we have an, uh, a, multi, an, a supranational level to any given policy you can think of. And I think of uh, migration, think of safety and security, um, economics, uh, the digital market, uh, uh, agriculture, trade, uh, job mobility. I mean, any given policy in, on, in Europe has an EU dimension to it, and that is where we work. That is where you can work. And this is really challenging, but it's very interesting. You are in the driving seat of the EU project in a way. You want to steer EU, the, the, the Europe into a certain direction, and you can be part of that. And that's very fascinating to, to, to be part of that, first of all. Secondly, of course, we offer this international work environment. I mentioned it already up front. Currently, myself, I work in EPSO. We are a body of only 120 staff, which is quite uh, uh, small in size. But within this group, we have about 22 or 23 different nationalities. It's very diverse. And it's very rich, actually, and, and enriching uh, to be surrounded by people from different backgrounds, different uh, cultures and languages. Um, it is enriching even on a personal level, you know, to, to make friends and colleagues in these different, from these different uh, areas. So it's quite nice to work um, in such an environment. I personally, I would never be able to go back to a Belgian, you know, Flemish uh, work environment. I used to work in a company which, which was very nice, you know, very nice uh, employer. But once you work in an international setting, I mean, your eyes open really, and uh, you would not be able to, to go back easily to uh, another working environment. We offer flexible working conditions, meaning you can work 90, 80, even up to 50% if you want. Uh, we currently work partly from home and partly from the office uh, since the pandemic, of course, but very probably whenever this pandemic is completely over, it will stay that way because it works. Uh, we have all the tools available to work from home. So currently we work uh, two days in the office and three days from home. So uh, it's quite convenient for people who have to commute to work, like myself, for instance. Um, but it's still nice to be in the office to, you know, to meet your, your, your colleagues um, physically and to keep yourself a social planet. 
And that indeed we are shaping Europe together, meaning we are not working for the profit of a company, but we are working for the benefits of 450 million EU citizens. It sounds big, but that's what it is. At the end of the day, that's what we do. We all work together on this common project. And I know that this is something which speaks out to younger generations, to people like you. You want to you know, do something for society. You want to support society. You want to uh, you know, work for a society to go into a certain direction. And this is exactly what we offer here and what we do uh, at the EU. So quite a nice environment, if you ask me. We offer training courses. Lifelong, you can enroll in training courses to develop personally. Uh, many people take language courses, for instance, you know, to, to, to learn new languages, to um, improve uh, existing languages already. We have courses, again, there's a, a, a whole variety, a whole catalog available of um, courses in uh, accountancy, in informatics, in speaking in public, uh, in developing soft skills. There's a whole catalog uh, you can sign up for free of charge during working hours. So it's quite nice to be able to develop uh, in the years to come. In my personal view, the nicest aspect of working here is the internal job mobility. And we have a bit this image against us that civil servants, you know, they enter the service, they enter the EU, and they would do the same job in the same office at the same desk for the rest of their career. That is clearly wrong. You know, this is the image. I don't know where it comes from, but it's not the case at all. It is quite easy for us to move between services, between institutions, and between cities. And in this way, make your own career in the, in the years to come. You've seen my slide uh, on my own um, history, if you like. And you saw that I started my career in Luxembourg. Uh, then I moved to Brussels. Within, in Brussels, in the commission, I moved between several um, DGs, director generals. Then again, I moved to EPSO. So, it is very easy to move around while still being employed by the same employer, the EU institutions. So how does this work? Again, there is a catalog of open vacancies available. If you're up for a new position, you just consult this catalog. If you find an interesting post, you apply. You do an interview with that future head of unit. If it matches, you take up your new position. If not, you stay where you are. So basically, you can't really lose. You can only win improve and change and find out and learn about new policies and opportunities in the years. So quite fascinating, actually, um, in my view. Work-life balance, I discussed it already. Uh, you know, currently we work in this hybrid mode, which may be convenient if you have families, for instance. Um, so all that is taken care of. We organize well-being initiatives to keep people happy and fit at work. And then, of course, um, uh, we also offer collaborative ways of working, basically meaning that you don't only have to work on the only on the file in your unit at your own desk in, in a way, but you can be involved in uh, inter-unit or even inter-institutional working groups and committees uh, if you're interested in that. So it's quite a collaborative way um, of working that we um, offer here. We pay a lot of attention to inclusion and diversity. So everybody is welcome to apply and come and work with us. We take care of any reasonable accommodation needed for you to be able to sit your tests and for you to be able to work with us if you have any uh, special need. So really, we don't discriminate uh, anyone at uh, any stage. So um, whatever you are or whoever you are, you're welcome to come and, and, and work with us. And then you may know that uh, we are well paid. Uh, we have a good pension. We have a good uh, social security system. We offer European schools. So if ever you have children, they can be educated in their own language in, uh, in Brussels or Luxembourg. So the whole package is actually quite nice uh, once you come and work uh, with us. Let's have a look now at how to join us, how to become an EU official. Everything would start on our website. And actually, I should change this slide here because we, we recently uh, changed our uh, website uh, just two weeks ago, I guess. So it looks a bit differently, but anyhow, uh, in the middle of the page, you see uh, job opportunities and under job opportunities, you will find a list of all upcoming opportunities for any type of contract. You have already discussed, I've understood the contract agents, you will find them there as well. But on, on, under the same link, you will find the list of permanent opportunities, contract opportunities, temporary opportunities, even traineeships. So everything is on one page in one 
um, a big scroll down um, menu basically. Whenever you find a competition of your liking, which matches your profile, you have to apply for it and you can enter the competition. So how does a competition look like? We currently have what we call two types of competitions. There is a set of competitions which we call specialist competitions, and then there are more generalist competitions. Specialist competitions are competitions in a specific field where we need people with a specific background and a number of years of experience. Now, I don't know in this group how many of you have just recently graduated or if you already work a number of years, depending on the years of experience you have, you may or may not uh, be eligible for a specialist competition. If you're not sure about where you are, just check the competition when we publish it and you will find the criteria there. You see on this slide here, grade 86, 87, AD obviously stands for administrator and AST stands for assistant. AD5 would be entry level grade. I speak about that in a minute when I talk about generalist competitions. For AD5 competitions, you do not need work experience. For AD6 level competitions, you always need three years of experience in the field. AD7 requires six years of experience in the field, just for you to know, okay? So this gives you an idea of whether or not you can take part uh, in a given uh, competition at a given uh, grade, because every competition is published at a specific grade. You cannot change it, okay? You have to meet the criteria for the grade of the competition. Then we have generalist competitions, and those are competitions in more common fields, like the ones listed here, law, audit, economics, and so on. Here, for these competitions, you do not, or we do not require professional experience. If you do have it, all good, you, but we don't, don't expect you to have it. If you have it, I mean, you can still apply, of course, but it's not an eligibility criteria. How do these competitions look like um, in, uh, how does the procedure look like? Every competition has a number of steps. Everything starts, of course, with an application. If you apply for a specialist competition, Part of your application will consist of what we call a talent screener. I will explain in a minute what that means. A second phase would be a set of reasoning skills tests. Then, of course, there will be a test to test your field, your knowledge in the field of the competition. And there will also always be an assessment center uh, at the end. This is the typical um, uh, uh, procedure for a specialist competition. I'll get back into details in a minute. The generalist competition is currently under review. Some of you might already know about our competition systems and might already know EPSO a bit. We used to run big generalist competitions open to all, open to everybody with a university degree. And currently the last two, three years, we have not run any new generalist competitions any longer because we are reviewing our competition model for this, comp for this uh, generalist competitions. Our current model is quite lengthy in time and quite complex. And we try to accommodate this. We try to make it shorter and simpler in procedure, okay? So the structure of a generalist competition is currently not set yet. As of 2023, we will start publishing generalist competitions again. So keep in touch with us, just eat, you know, have a look on, on our website from time to time or follow us on our social media channels. If you look for EU careers, either on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or uh, Instagram, you will be updated with you know, uh, every competition that we publish and you will be updated with information uh, on, uh, regarding the ongoing procedure for uh, these uh, new competitions. As of 2023, you will be back in the game um, for generous competitions if you do not have any work experience yet, okay? Now, Parts of the specialist competitions will come back in the generalist competitions as well later on. Uh, not every step, but some parts will come back. The talent screener um, is something which we only use for specialist competitions. So this is basically a set of questions uh, which we use to assess your degrees and professional experience in the field, okay? So for instance, if we're looking for uh, uh, experts in regional development, we want to see if you have professional experience in that field through a set of questions. 
your answers to those questions will give you a set of points, marks, and the ones high, uh, um, most highly ranked will be invited to the next stage of the uh, uh, selection procedure. That's how it works, okay? The reasoning skills test will very probably also be a part of the new competition model for generalist competitions. So in this phase, we test your verbal, numerical, and abstract reasoning skills. You should test this, you should train this. If ever you take part in a competition, please, before going to the real competition, go to our website and train this. We have a sample test page available where you can train these different tests in any language, okay? There are, the sample tests are available in the 24 official languages. So have a go and test your verbal, numerical, and abstract reasoning. Because if you do this a lot, if you practice this a lot, you will get better at it. First of all, there is the, the level of difficulty of these questions. But secondly, there's also a time factor involved. You know, there's a time restriction. So you have to be able to solve these questions quickly. And by doing this often, you get better at it, okay? A field-related test is also a typical test for a specialized competition, uh, where we obviously test your knowledge in the field, uh, quite um, uh, simple to explain, actually. And then there is the assessment center. The assessment center will always uh, happen, be it in a specialist competition or in a generalist competition. In the assessment, you will sit two tests out of the six ones you see listed here. So it can either be a case study, which is a written test. It can be a presentation to make on a file you have to prepare. There will always be an interview with the selection board. So the, the two tests will be um, defined by the selection board, of course, and th those are described and explained in what we call the notice of competition. The notice of competition is the, the big legal document which we publish at the day when we launch a new competition. So please do read that document carefully. It'll give you all detailed information on the procedure, on, on the, the time you get to solve your, your, your steps or your questions, uh, the points you need to go from one stage to the next, uh, the description of the, of the job. I mean, everything is there. It's really very, very detailed. So the ones, um, yeah, just for you to know, uh, during this assessment center, we test competencies, uh, eight of them. You see them listed here. Uh, for the new competition model, you know, for the new generalist competition, the eight competencies have slightly changed. So some, some competencies are exactly the same. Some competencies have changed. The, the bigger change is the one, the third one on this slide here, uh, the digital literacy, which is a new test, which we currently don't have um, in the, the current system. Uh, but just for you to know, um, many competencies are alike and some will change uh, since the needs change uh, for staff to, to join us. So the ones who make it through all these different stages of the competition are the successful candidates. And those are the ones that will be then recruited by these different uh, bodies and institutions, you know, the 10 uh, that I showed you on the very first slide. Whenever you make it to this list of successful candidates, uh, I advise you to get in touch with your member state authorities, uh, with the, your permanent representation uh, here in Brussels or, or in Malta, uh, and they can, help you in finding a job you know they have eyes and ears around the institutions and they can guide you also throughout your competition uh, in preparing you to the competition uh, to to be able that you can be successful in it okay to give you an idea of the timeline of a competition uh, currently um, a competition would take about 10 months altogether so it is quite lengthy from you know publishing of the competition until until publishing of the list of successful candidates We've got these different steps with different months in between. So in a way, it gives you time to prepare for each step uh, within um, you know, um, the whole procedure. But in the end, it is quite lengthy. Once we have published the list of successful candidates, our objective is to recruit everybody in the year to come. So some people get a job offer after you know, 11, 12 months, uh, after publishing the competition, of course. Other people have to wait a couple of months later, depending on the vacancies in, in the institutions. But then again, you know, get in touch with your, with your uh, uh, administration and they may help you in finding a, an, uh, a post for you a bit sooner than someone else. 
this is just a slide to show you what upcoming competitions we will publish. Actually, um, uh, yeah, the first one, actually, I should remove now because uh, you can no longer apply for that one. But you see on this slide, all the competitions are specialist competitions. You see, they're very um, specialized, uh, experts in space and defense. Actually, today at noon, we will publish a competition for heads of administration in delegations. Remember these embassies outside of the EU? They need heads to run the day-to-day -day, uh, business of the of the delegation, um, and we publish that competition uh, today. Then uh, you see another one in finance, accountancy, and digital communication, maybe of interest of you. We publish that at the end of September. It's an AST3 competition, meaning you do not need a university level degree, but you do need at least three years of experience in one of these fields, either in finance, accountancy, uh, web, web uh, master, uh, graphic uh, design also. There are different fields in that competition. So when, whenever we publish it on the 22nd of uh, September, go have a look, see if you meet the criteria and you can uh, sign up and, and give it a go. Later in the year, we will publish a competition for specialists in energy and climate, and then one for security as well. So of course, this list is updated regularly. Uh, as I said, we publish these, of course, on our website, and we also um, uh, post them on our social media channels. You see here the application period for each competition is about one month, sometimes a bit longer, uh, but it's uh, roughly a month. You must, of course, validate your application within this given deadline. Uh, whenever you apply for a competition, you don't have to fill your application in one go. You can save your, your um, data that you have entered and then come, come back later to it and, uh, and complete it. But you must, of course, validate and send us your application uh, before the last day uh, of this application period. Keep this in mind because I'm going to speak about something else now and I will refer to this, okay? So keep it in mind. So this is what I want to share with you um, about permanent staff opportunities, okay? To become a permanent staff uh, member, a civil servant, you have to go through this competition. Now, I will very briefly say a couple of words about other staff categories. I know that you have already uh, discussed contract agents. Uh, maybe just briefly uh, recap that. Um, have you spoken about temporary agents already? Yes. You have, so you know uh, about those. Interim staff, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Just a quick word about interim staff. So interim staff are people who are hired through temping agencies uh, here in Brussels or in Luxembourg. It's quite short in duration of time. Interim people basically replace uh, people who go on maternity leave, for instance, or who are on sick leave for a longer period of time, and they need to replace, be replaced quickly. Um, for those positions, you need to register at a temping agency, for instance, um, Randstad, or uh, what's the other one? Do you know the heart? Uh, anyway, you'll find them on our website, and uh, the, the temping agencies where you can register. Freelancers are people who mostly work in the linguistic departments. Um, as you may remember, I told you that you need to have two EU languages to work with us. Now, linguists need to speak three EU languages. A translator or an interpreter will always work from two source EU languages into one main EU language, okay? Now, all these languages, of these three are EU languages. Now you can imagine that whenever we have a summit with a third country, say with China, we need interpretation and translation into Chinese. And there we would call upon the services of freelancers to help us out there, okay? So from time to time, we launch calls for people who speak third languages. So if you speak third languages and you're interested in, in becoming a translator, for instance, you could apply for a freelance position there. Then we have seconded national experts. Seconded national experts are civil servants in their home country, and they are seconded to the EU, and they come and work with us for a number of years and share their knowledge and experience uh, with us. So to be seconded to us, you first need to be a civil servant in your, in your uh, home country. And then I'll say a word about trainees as well. So very quickly, maybe again about contract agents. I know you discussed it, just to give you the overview. Uh, we have permanently available profiles, 15 or so, you, you, you must recognize them if you followed the, the session on uh, contract agents. 
you can always register for these. And this is what I what I want to say when I said I will refer to the slide about competitions. If you want to take part in a competition to become a, a civil servant, you must register within a given deadline. For these contract agent positions, there is no deadline. That's the difference. Registration is always open. The difference is that when you register for one or more of these uh, opportunities in the contract agent list, when you register, you, you basically show your interests and you sit, your name sits in a database of people. You are not automatically called to the first stage of testing, which is the case when you apply for a competition to become a permanent official. Remember, when you apply there, you will, everybody who applies will be invited to the first stage of testing. The first stage mostly being the reasoning skills test um, or for specialist competitions, the talent screener part, okay? For contract, contract agents, it's different. You basically sit in a database of interested people and only when an institution or an agency needs these people, they will consult this database of people and make a pre-selection of interesting profiles. So this is what I show on the next slide. Registration is always open. Pre-selection is done by the rec recruiting body and they will send those pre-selected people to EPSO to be tested. We test verbal, numerical and abstract reasoning and the knowledge in the field. If you are successful, you can be hired, okay? Now, uh, I'm sure you discussed this. This is quite an, an a shorter and an easier, in a way, way to get in because we run these contract agent tests five, six, seven times a year. And the procedure is much shorter because it's only verbal, numerical, abstract, comp competency test, and then an interview with a recruiting body. So it can be quite quick uh, to be hired as a contract agent. Then we also have what we call ad hoc vacancies. And those are contract positions in a, diff, in a specific place for a specific position. And there is a deadline to apply for those positions. You see them listed here. Again, you'll find them on our website under uh, job opportunities. Okay, just for, for you to recap this. And then a final word about traineeships. Um, every institution organizes traineeships. So they're not centralized by EPSO. We do not uh, select them. Every institution selects their own trainees but we give you on our website an overview of all the institutions and bodies that offer traineeships. And there's a lot of them. There's like maybe 30 or 40 different bodies that offer traineeships. The application periods for all these different bodies and institutions vary. Um, I'll give you the information about the commission traineeship because the commission being the biggest institution offers the highest number of uh, traineeship posts. Uh, every year, the commission welcomes about 1,800 trainees. It's massive. It's the biggest traineeship scheme in the world, really. They run uh, traineeships two times a year of five months, one starting in March and one starting in October. It's a paid traineeship. You get about 1,200 euros a, a month. Um, and how does it work? Of course, you have to apply within the deadline. And when I, when I say uh, within the deadline, each summer, you have to apply for the uh, for a traineeship which starts in March, and each January you can apply for the for a traineeship starting in October. Okay, so you have to be uh, in advance a bit. You need at least a bachelor degree already, and you need to speak two EU languages, one of which must be English, French, or German. Again, for you guys, this is uh, not an issue. We also have a, a small number of posts available for non-EU citizens. So if you have uh, friends or if yourself are, are not an EU citizen, uh, these people can also apply to become a trainee at the commission. There's no age limit. Actually for all of our positions, be it as a civil servant, so a permanent position or a contract agent or a temporary agent, there is never an age limit. So you can apply until the age of say, 67, all right? Um, you cannot have worked with the institutions prior to your traineeship. This is basically meaning you can't do two, two traineeships, okay? This is to give the opportunity, opportunity to do traineeship to as many people possible, basically. How does it work? Uh, there are no tests involved, 
basically it's an online application, of course. Um, once you have applied, you go through a sifting uh, where we look at your application and your CV. So that's why you should make your application as rich as possible. Mention all languages you speak, not only two, but if you speak three or four, do mention them. Uh, please mention if you've done an Erasmus, if you have uh, experiences abroad, if you've done voluntary work, make it as rich as possible because you get points for every single thing I just mentioned. And again, the ones mostly most highly ranked go to the next phase until they end up on the in what we call the blue book. The blue book is the list of all selected trainees. And these people are then offered a position in, in all these different um, uh, services of the commission. When you apply, you can uh, indicate three services where you would like to do your traineeship. Uh, and we take this into account. We really try and put, you know, uh, if possible, your first choice. We want to give you um, a position in your first uh, choice DG. If not possible, then we go to the second or the third. So we try to accommodate everybody's um, interests there. Also good to know, uh, but again, you will have a session on traineeships later on, I know, but just for you to mention already. Um, every, uh, every traineeship or at the end of every traineeship, the commission offers the opportunity to a selected number of trainees to stay on board. And that is quite interesting. It's called the JPP, the Junior Professionals Program. And all trainees are offered the opportunity to step into this program. They have to sit uh, a couple of tests. Uh, and when they are successful, they can enter this program. And what happens then is during two years, you as a trainee will stay with us in four different services, each time six months. So you will work for six months in one service, then to a next, then again to a next. And the fourth, uh, last term of six months, you go back to your uh, DG of origin, where you did your initial traineeship. After these two years, you are allowed to take part in an internal competition to become a civil servant. So this is quite a nice uh, parcours or, or opportunity uh, to stay on board and to work with us. Because apart from this, there is no direct link between being a trainee and becoming a civil servant. Everybody who wants to become a civil servant has to go through the competition system, which I explained um, uh, earlier today. All right. So this is a bit what I wanted to share with you. It is now 42, I was a bit longer maybe. But if you have questions, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, if you have questions, I'm very open to answering uh, everything that touches upon EU careers, please. Thank you, Kuhn, for that. It was very informative. Um, we have actually received two questions so far. I will start from a, with our first one from Miss Claire Gallia. Um, she's asking, do traineeships within the EU institutions give you more uh, favorable advantage on being shortlisted within competitions? So um, to, the answer is a bit double here. So first of all, you, you heard me mentioning the eligibility criteria. So to be able to take part in a competition, the traineeship does not count in a way because you just need your citizenship, your languages and your degree. If you have that, you can take part. Now, of course, Everything which you have in your rucksack, in a way, as you know, as, as background information, may and probably will help you to perform better in, say, the assessment center, where you sit your interview, where you do have to do a presentation. If you've done a traineeship, you have some knowledge about the internal cuisine of the institutions. You're familiar with jargon. You're familiar with how the system works uh, from within. And this, of course, may give you some advantage over someone who has no clue about how it works here. Again, referring to myself, I did not do a traineeship before I did my competition. I did succeed. So it is, of course, possible to, to succeed without having done a traineeship. But it gives you more, more, more background, background information and more, more, more weight in a way. Same goes for any other um, experience that you might have had. You heard me mention that for an AD5 competition, you do not need work experience. So as a fresh graduate, just after um, graduating, you can enter an AD5 competition. But we see, and it makes sense in a way, we see that most of our candidates in an AD5 competition are not fresh graduates at the age of 22 or 23. No, the average age of a person in an AD5 competition is around 30. So these people have some experience. 
they either have done a traineeship, they have worked already a number of years, and then they you know, want to enter the institution, which, which makes perfect sense. I did it myself as well. You've heard my, my background story as well. So in a nutshell, yes, it does help you, but again, it's not a, it's not a must to do it, okay? Okay, thank you for that. Cool. Shall we take your question, Victoria, please? Hi. So I see, yes, please. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I'd like to ask about costs. I know today is about uh, permanent official competitions. Um, if you take a second cost uh, exam from a different profile, would you be able to find employment within the same institution? Uh, basically, my situation is that I work as a temporary agent already with the council. Um, had I to take a separate cost profile exam, would I uh, be eligible for working within the council, but based on that profile? I'm just just seeing my options here. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question indeed. And the answer is indeed yes. So uh, because uh, all these different contracts are separate contracts. And if the council has a contract agent position available for which you are eligible and for which uh, you can be hired, then you can be hired, no matter that, no matter uh, whether you have done previous employments under other contracts in the same institution, it does not matter. So yes, indeed, you can stay in the same um, institution if you want so. Thank you. Okay. Then um, we saw a question on the chat saying, what do the FG grades stand for? That's a good question. I didn't mention it. So you saw on my slide uh, on contract agents, functions group one, two, three, and four. Uh, groups three and four um, are similar to AD grade positions and functions group one and two are similar to what we call the assistant grades. Okay, so just to give you an idea, that's about uh, how it works. Uh, let me see, do you want someone else to ask a question? If not, I'll, I'm scrolling through the... We just have a final chat. one. I think we can take it from our end as well. Um, yeah. Can you apply for a traineeship in January before you graduate for October? Um, I think you would need to prove that you would have the diploma. So Haley, at that point, it would be best that you apply for the next session which opens in August. Um, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, Kuhn. Yes, correct, indeed. For, for traineeships, you do need to have your degree in your hands, so to speak. Uh, to be able to to um, to apply, so the degree you must have a degree by the end of the application period, not by the time you would start your traineeship. That's that's how it is. If I just might clarify for the case of Malta, particularly, if you have a transcript which shows that you have been already awarded your degree, but you will get the official certificate in November, as we do from the University of Malta, you can get a letter from the University of Malta stating that you have completed your degree with a full transcript, and it should cover you in that case, okay? And is it more favorable to do an exchange inside or outside the EU? So that's a good question. Actually, again, both work. Uh, we have seen people who have experiences in, in the States or in the Middle East or in Africa. I mean, again, depending on your profile and depending on the, the work or the, 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 the DG, you know, the director general where you could work, this experience you might have outside of the EU may be very, very valuable, you know, depending on the line of work that they're uh, looking for staff for. Again, uh, and again, depending on the work of uh, which is for which a vacancy is, is available, experience within the within the EU is valuable. It 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 can go either way basically. Okay. Uh, let me see if I see other questions here. The link you have received it. Sample tests uh, you have sent the link very well. The grades you've done it. Uh, Trados, yeah, the, the Trados question. Uh, I don't know what Trados is, so. Um, We've done the application for a traineeship, the exchange, we've done it. Okay, so I guess we've covered all the questions so far. Uh, yeah. Just for you to know, so you can, please, if, you, if ever you take part in a competition and you fail at some stage, which is normal in a way, because the majority does fail at some, some stage at, at some point, don't get disappointed. Um, because I, it's very, a very human reaction to say, okay, I failed, this is not for me, I you know I have to do something else. Please do try again. Because first of all, we do not take into account the results of a, of a previous competition. You just start a new one from scratch. Please give it another try. Many people do so, and eventually they make it. You know, it's just you have to be sometimes a bit 
lucky in a way, but you have to, of course, prepare well. Also, you can try and do all these different opportunities at the same time. You can register for a cast profile. Meanwhile, you can apply for a temporary agent position. Meanwhile, you can you know, launch an application for a competition. Nothing excludes one another, okay? So give it a go at any opportunity that we offer. Uh, because as I say, and I hope you, you, you agree with me that what we offer inside here is really fascinating. Huh? It's what the, the line of work we do, the environment we work in, it is, if you're into it, I mean, if you're into international work environments, this is the place to be. If you're into shaping Europe, this is the place to be. So don't get disappointed. Again, I, I, I'm just repeating myself. Don't get disappointed if you fail a first time um, because um, many people, uh, most people actually around me, uh, colleagues of mine have tried multiple times before really uh, succeeding uh, in a competition. Okay, Jeffrey, to, to, to give that message to you. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that, Kuhn. And um, now I will share my screen and introduce our speakers for today. Um, I would just like to make a quick point, just in case someone had not seen my previous emails, um, that as Kuhn mentioned, which is closing very soon, there is a competition for defense and in this, uh, for professionals in the fields of defense and in industry and space. And overall, 100 successful candidates will be selected. And then we have something which is great for us Maltese, which is the intercultural and language professionals. Uh, the European Parliament is looking for Maltese translators and 12 successful Maltese translators will be selected. I must point out that this competition is not being done by EPSO, but is actually being done by the Euro Parliament, European Parliament directly. And if you are selected, you will be a permanent official. Okay, so if you require more information on that, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and we'll help you out on that. So introducing our speakers for today, our first speaker is Miss Angèle Le Bon um, She's a legal officer, legal and policy officer within the Civil Justice Department, of the European Commission, Director General for Justice and Consumers. Um, Angel is a lawyer by profession and she has been working within the European institutions for the past 18 years. So almost pre-accession over there, Angel. Uh, since 2019, Angel has been working at the European Commission in DG Justice as a correspondent and negotiator in the unicitural and the Hague negotiation on behalf of the EU and its member states and responsible for the implementation of the European Union appears in the area of justice and civil matters. Angel enjoys traveling, trying new food and a crime, a true crime podcast junkie. I will stop um, the recording now so we can go ahead with our speakers, okay? Just one second, because I have lost. <laughs> 